Hello again. I'm going to be going through section three now. So section three is a bit different insofar as we can get a bit more information from the regs because the section one is covering, it's not really covered by our regs because it's covered, it's the DNO works with a different set of regs. So let me show you a really important page inside the regs book. So we get our brown book out. Hopefully everyone's got the latest one. I assume this is the latest one. Uh, page five two seven. Now this is a example of the inspection sheet that we're gonna go through. What's important on this, so section one, it's just list what I listed in my last video. However, when we go down, notice that each one of these has a reg after it. So you can actually look up exactly what you're looking for. So this is where things can get a little bit easier while going through the inspections to refer them to a reg. So let's start with 3.1 presence and condition of distributing earthen equipment these are our regs so for 3.1 we've got these two regs tns and tncs and they're both the same thing basically a main earthen terminal of the installation should be connected to the earth point of the source so if we have a look here there is two earths in here there's a separate tns earth and there's one coming off the sheath of it but they've both been provided and connected to the MET. So, so far so good. 3.1 is a tick. Now 3.2 is the same, but for an earth electrode. So it's literally the reg underneath it. And it's the same thing. As this is an ATT, we're gonna put NA in that box. It's non-applicable to this installation. So our next one is 3.3, provision of earthing and bonding labels at all appropriate locations. There's our reg number. As if by magic, here we are. A durable warning notice with the word safety electrical connection do not remove shall be securely fixed in a visible position at or near the point of connection for every earthing conductor to an earth electrode. It's basically at the bonding to extraneous conductive parts and a main earthing terminal where separate from switch gear. So I've bonded these two old gas pipes. So you can see, oh, that's a nice noise. <laughs> so you've got the words there on our bonding clamps. This is the MET. So the MET has safety electrical connection on it, which is separate from the fuse board. Um, now I'll take you over to the gas now. Now this is my gas pipe. And this is what Octopus done when they removed my gas meter. So um, yeah. It's there and the label's there. However, we'll get to this further on in the video. Oh, see that? In case you didn't know, I work out. <laughs> so as you can see, with this, you can, even if you're unsure, you can look it up and it might give you a bit of an idea. There are other reference methods, um, reference methods, Christ alive. There are other reference materials. So you've got the code breakers and I think um, there's a safety thingy my bob as well but they're not the bible on it you do have to make your own engineering judgment but if you are unsure you can refer to our bible to better understand what we're looking for so now we can see there's bonding can the actual labels are at all of the locations required so let's move on to the next one so our next one is 3.4 confirmation of earthing conductor size now we've got a couple of regs here let's get to the right page so the cross-sectional area can be calculated in accordance with regulation 543.1.3, which is our adiabatic equation, or it can be selected in accordance with regulation 543.1.4, which is here, which states that we can use table 54.7, .7, which is here. And there's our table. So we've got the cross-sectional area of the live conductor, S, so if it's 16 mil or less, it needs to be the same size. So 16 mil will be 16 mil. The, if it's 16 to 35 mil, which is most are, it'd be about 25 mil. We need a 16 mil conductor. And in a domestic setting, which most people are gonna be using this video for, if it's greater than 35 mil. Now, I've never seen the greater than 35 mil in all honesty, but let's say it was 50 mil, half the size of it at least, so 25 mil. Let's have a little look over here. We have 16 mil tails, and here's our earthing conductor, which is actually labeled, which is also 16 mil. 
So we've got a big, we've got a tick for that one. So our next one, 3.5, accessibility and condition of earthing conductor at MET. We've got a little reg number there. We shoot on over there. It says every connection and joint shall be accessible for inspection and testing and maintenance except as provided by reg regulation 526.3. So is it all accessible? Let's have a little butchers. Pretty clear here, pretty clear here. And you saw my horse in octopus one. So I would say that is a pass. 3.6, confirmation of main bonding conductor sizes. So we've got 544.1 and here we are, main, main protective bonding conductors. So except where PME conditions apply, the main bonding conductor shall have a cross-sectional area of not less than half the cross-sectional area required by the earthing conductor. So our earthing conductor is 16 mil, and our bonding conductors, which there are quite a few of, are 10 mil. So that is another pass on that inspection. What you may find is six mil bonding conductors on a PME system. Now, this would be coded as a C3 in my opinion, unless you had signs of burning where things were being diverted down to a separate earth path so there might be a bad pen conductor and then these might start getting the six mil might start getting hot so something to bear in mind it may not be ideal as in it's not half the size however when it was installed it was probably okay so if it's six mil and there's no signs of burning it can be noted down as a c3 however if you were going to upgrade the board you would have to bear that in mind because you have to upgrade this so it complies so if you are upgrading the board and the bonding is only six mil, you're gonna to have to quote for the bonding to be upgraded as well. Okay, 3.7, condition and accessibility of main protective bonding conductor connections. So if we have a look at the regs, they should be accessible as per this reg that we've looked at before. And then we've got this reg, which is stating where it should be connected. So it's saying it should be as near as possible where it enters the building more or less. And before any T's, but, and uh, where practical, the connection shall be made within 600 mil of the meter union outlet. It's as far as reasonably practicable. That's the thing that needs to, we need to take into account here. So I see in a lot of installations that people run a 10 mil outside of a building, lash it down and to get it to the meter. Is that as reasonably practical? And then leaving it outside to open to the elements I would argue no. So it's where it enters the building. So where it enters the building and first pops up is where it should be bonded. Because there's no other point at where it's gonna you can come into contact with it. So say it's an old building that comes into a basement and then it comes along and then comes up, say, somewhere in a cupboard or wherever it may be. I would argue that taking the bond outside is just a bit bit much in my opinion. So it's where it, it's reasonably practicable. And then I see people Put them under the floorboard so enter a building and it's under the floor fair enough there's a note on the board saying this has been done however does that make it sort of easy to access for maintenance and check-in i would argue not so people get bogged down with it for far too much you know there's the argument it could tee off under the floorboards and what have you but it's just that far as reasonably practical so if you're on a second floor flat and you're running a 10 mil outside and running it down the outside of the building to hit the gas meter there, I would argue that that is way too excessive. It's where it enters the flat itself before any unions, if possible. That's my two cents on it. I'm not correct. I'm just giving my opinion on it, but it's just something to bear in mind. And um, yeah, don't bury bonding connections under the floor. And if you are going to, please leave a note for the next electrician because it just makes it a bit of a a nightmare. Finally, 3.8, accessibility and condition of other protective bonding connections. So we've got our two reg numbers there. If we head over. So we've got a protective conductor shall be suitably protected against mechanical and chemical deterioration and electrodynamic effects. And then we've got our other one about accessibilities to connections. Now, other bonding conductors in a domestic center, uh, setting, we're talking about supplementary bonding conductors. So we have a whole section here on them. Now, if you didn't grow up around the 16th edition, it can be a bit of a minefield when you come across 
so you'll see in 16th edition installation and it will have maybe RC protection on the socket and nothing on the lights. There's nothing wrong with this if supplementary bonding is in place. So a supplementary bonding conductor will go from the circuits inside the bathroom. So if it's a lighting circuit, normally a formula will be taken off the light or the pull cord and go down and tag the radiator, the kitchen, uh, sorry, the sink and the bath taps. It was hard to sort of hard hide these things though. And it's, it's one of those things that it's not a nice thing to see. So they were hidden quite well. Um, a supplementary bonding conductor means if the bonding conductor came off for whatever reason, like a plumber, like you've seen Octopus have taken my gas one off, that supplementary bonding was there to keep the potential the same across all the metal work, so it was an additional protection in place. So it doesn't need RCD protection, or didn't at the time. The important thing is that it needs to go across all of the circuits in the bathroom. So if there's a shower there, it needs to link to the shower as well, and then the pipe work. Because if it doesn't, then there could be a difference in potential. So the whole point is to tag everything in the bathroom. So no matter what you touch metal work wise, it's the same potential. So under fault conditions, there's no potential difference. So you can't get any shocks off of anything in the bathroom. And so checking those connections can be really difficult. They can be underneath a bath panel. They can, sometimes they bring them into an immersion cupboard that's nearby and they'll tag across all of the pipes but you need to take the light down to see if there's a four mil cable there, the pull cord down and see if there's a uh, four mil cable there and any other circuits in there. Other times they used to come off the shaver light as well and come down and tag the pipes. So it's an important part of the inspection and it's a really important cable as well. So the accessibility part of this is normally failed because people don't want to see a green and yellow cable coiled up and tagged onto their radiator. They'd rather it hidden in the boxing that goes to the radiator. So it's a tough one to sort of inspect, but it's very, very important. And don't just go along failing installations just purely because it hasn't got an RCD on a lighting circuit in a bathroom. If it's got supplementary bonding, there is nothing wrong with it and it's fine for continued use. But my opinion is not fact. Do your own research and due diligence. This is just a little guide and sort of help for it. but. It's, it's, it's something that is a bit of a bugbear of mine and a lot of people get ripped off when there's nothing wrong with their installation. It could be better, don't get me wrong, RCDs are fantastic, but it seems to be just RCD everything. It's not a cure-all for everything and uh, yes, a lot of people do get ripped off unfortunately. But let me show you that uh, earthing connection again that Octopus left. So as I said, when this was uh, the gas meter was taken out, this is how they left my installation. So they've left it in an unsafe condition because this isn't tagged. I mean, realistically, I'm not likely to touch this and anything else in my house because it's buried in a cupboard, but it's not great. And unfortunately, and I'm not knocking plumbers, but I am, they seem to think this is just nothing. It's something that gets in their way. So they quite often just go, oh, don't need that and sod it off. So when you're doing your EICRs, you do come across these sorts of things. The easiest thing to do is just to pop it back on and uh, and be done with it. Another thing to point out is that this is just inspections. However, as part of this, I would test this conductor because I have had it before where people do some dodgy bits and I'll explain more. So what I've seen electricians do is they get a bit of 10 mil, connect it into the fuse board and then they shove three or four meters up into the ceiling. And then they'll do the same at the water or gas and then we'll connect it and shove it up into the ceiling. So it looks like it's bonded. So if you're just doing visual checks, just to look at it, you think, right, that's bonded, no problem. But unless you're using your tester to confirm that it's actually connected, then how can you possibly know it's a good connection? So I would always take the MET, take the cable out, well, power off first, take the cable out the MET and then test the uh, length of cable to prove that it's actually one long piece of cable and the resistance isn't through the roof. There's this weird number that comes 0 0.05 and it has to be below that value. I'm not sure where that actually comes from. If you can show me where it comes from in the regs, please put it in the comments because as far as I know, I'm not sure where it comes from. I mean, there's not, I can't see anything that says 
that the reading has to be below 0.05. I imagine it's because of the length of conductor. So if it gets below, over that value, the conductor is probably a bit too long. So it'd be better to be upgraded to maybe a 16 mil or that kind of thing. But let me know if you know where that number comes from because it's a mystery. But 100% should be testing it with your wonder lead and getting a reading just to confirm it. Hopefully that's helped you better understand section three of our inspection schedules. Um, I'm going to try and do the rest as I go along and uh, go through the rest of the section. So we've got our consumer units and final circuits. Those are going to be a lot more in depth and because uh, there's so many more bits that you can find. And um, there should be some good examples of what to find, common mistakes. I'm going to keep banging my head on this poxy thing above me. But uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed it. See you next time.